So again, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Brown. I'm one of the senior hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center, uh, coming to you from my home this morning in South Florida. Uh, we're joined by a distinguished panel of folks uh, this morning that you should see on the screen. Uh, we'll spend about uh, half the time this morning going through a presentation, uh, which will talk to you about uh, hurricanes, uh, uh, how they form, uh, how we forecast them and their hazards. And then we'll leave plenty of time for your questions uh, this morning. Uh, and again, I'll introduce the panel here in just a minute. Uh, you ask the questions by entering your question in the uh, question box. I see someone just uh, said cool. So that is uh, where you would enter uh, again those questions. And um, again, we'll, we'll, a couple of us are going to be answering some of those questions as uh, the webinar is progressing. But again, we'll save a lot of those questions for the end uh, and again, we want to, to be able to, to answer those. So please keep those questions coming. I probably won't get to all of them uh, because I know a lot of you are gonna ask them, but we'll get to as many of those as we can. So again, uh, thank you and, and welcome. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna ask uh, Robbie to uh, uh, send us over to the next slide and we'll get to start in the presentation. I'll introduce the, again the panelists and then uh, we'll listen to, uh, to, to Robbie this morning. So uh, our... Uh, First slide here is to show you that, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands are uh, uh, no strangers to hurricanes. Uh, hurricanes do affect uh, uh, those areas. Uh, thankfully, not every single hurricane season, but our past history does show us that we have to be prepared each and every hurricane season because we don't know if uh, this year or if, uh, you know, future years will be the year in which we get hit. If we go all the way back to 1989, you'll see Hurricane Hugo was one of those uh, very devastating storms uh, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And then we move ahead uh, uh, to Georgia's, which was uh, in 1998. And in more recent times, uh, been pretty active the last few hurricane seasons uh, with storms such as uh, Dorian, uh, Irma, and then of course, Maria, which directly affected Puerto Rico. Uh, so again, um, we are glad you can join us this morning where you can learn a lot about these storms. Uh, our panelists this morning, uh, include uh, John that you'll see uh, up in the corner. John's going to uh, uh, help me with the questions uh, this morning and uh, we'll be our uh, panel members uh, reading those questions to the other folks on. Uh, Robbie is uh, going to, uh, he's also a senior hurricane specialist or hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center and he'll be uh, uh, taking us through the presentation this morning. I'm also joined by Andy. He's going to uh, talk about the second half of our presentation. He's also a hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. And finally, we're also joined by Ernesto Morales. Uh, he is with the National Weather Service office in San Juan. We are all part of the National Weather Service. We all work together when hurricanes are threatening. And so he's going to talk to you about what they do in uh, the office there in Puerto Rico, not just with hurricanes, but with the uh, weather year round. And then we'll talk a lot about how we work together when hurricanes are threatening. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to, uh, to Robbie uh, to help uh, get things started this morning. So thanks. Hey, thanks, Dan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning for this webinar. Uh, so Dan just told you that all of us on this panel are meteorologists. So uh, you probably heard that term before, but do you really know what is a meteorologist? So if you think about it, really, it's a pretty easy answer. It's somebody who studies or forecasts the weather. So you see that on the screen here, we have pictures of several different meteorologists. In fact, you can see Dan there on the lower right uh, picture, who's actually giving an interview to someone from the media. Uh, it looks like that may have actually been in Puerto Rico, possibly. Uh, so as you can see that meteorologists have different types of jobs. Most people think about TV watch TV and you see somebody on TV who's telling you what the weather is going to be. But there are a lot of us behind the scenes that also predict the weather and forecast the weather or study the weather. Uh, a lot of us at the Hurricane Center, other weather service offices, and people that do research in weather. So meteorologists come in all different varieties, not just the type that are on TV, but there are a lot of us that are behind the scenes doing the forecasts as well. So the National Hurricane Center which is where Dan, John, Andy, and I work. We're in Miami, Florida. So you can see there on the map, we're saying greetings from Miami, the South Florida area. Uh, that's where we live and work. And this is a picture of the National Hurricane Center. You can see it's a pretty sturdy building. It's made of concrete and steel because in South Florida, we can be affected by hurricanes as well. So 
We want to make sure that the building that we work in, when there is a storm, is very strong and can withstand the winds from the hurricane. So at the National Hurricane Center, we forecast for hurricanes that occur over the Atlantic Ocean and also over the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, we're not just worried about storms that might affect the United States or other parts of the Caribbean, but even say, look at the Pacific coast of Mexico, oftentimes we can have hurricanes there as well. Uh, so we're watching those storms and predicting where they might go and how strong we think they're going to get as well. Not only do we worry about hurricanes, but at the Hurricane Center, we're also telling people what the ocean might be like during different types of weather. So you can see on the screen here that if you were ever to take a cruise on a cruise ship, or if you have a boat or a yacht that you take out into the ocean, or maybe uh, you know people, family or friends that work on oil rigs, uh, all of those kinds of people need to know what are the weather conditions going to be like when you're on that boat or vessel, and what are the waves going to be like? So at the Hurricane Center, we also provide forecasts on the ocean conditions in the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Caribbean Sea. So it's not just about storms, all year round, we have to be worried about what are the weather conditions across these areas. Now, as Dan mentioned, at the Hurricane Center, we work within the National Weather Service, as does Ernesto in San Juan. So you might be asking, well, where is the National Weather Service? Well, the great thing for all of us in the United States is that it's actually everywhere. You can probably see on this map here that everywhere in the, across the United States, there's these areas where there's an office from the National Weather Service that tells you what the weather's going to be like where you live. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ernesto real quick, who's gonna talk about specifically the National Weather Service office in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So yeah, good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us in this uh, webinar. Uh, yes, we are uh, part of the National Weather Service family. We are around 20 uh, employees that work from the South Juan office. And our part of our duties is to do the daily forecast uh, for not only Puerto Rico, also for the U.S. Virgin Islands and surrounding waters. Um, so when these guys here, they do the forecast of the intensity and the track of the hurricane, locally what we do is focus on the impact of this uh, forecast of the, uh, of the hurricane. So how that hurricane is going to affect us so people here in the island can make the right decision. So daily, uh, we do the daily weather also. So everything you see on TV probably came out from our office. You know, uh, you do uh, like 24 seven, we work around the clock. Uh, we always do in the forecast because weather doesn't, uh, doesn't matter the time, it could, have, uh, could happen. So we don't want surprises out there. And we're always watching, uh, the weather for, for the security of, of the, our people here in the Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Hey, thanks, Ernesto. That's, that's great uh, roundup of the National Weather Service. So, you know, let's, let's dive right into hurricanes, because I know that's what everybody's here to, to actually see. So what you're seeing on your screen now is an animation of a hurricane that affected the Tex of, uh, coast of Texas a couple of years ago. This is actually Hurricane Harvey that made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane. So as you're watching this video, you're probably noticing that there's a place there in the center of the screen where it doesn't look like there's many clouds. You're looking at a satellite image, so the satellite's way up above the Earth's surface. It's taking a picture of what it sees down at the Earth, and this is the clouds associated with this hurricane. But in there in the center, you can see that area where it doesn't look like there's that many clouds. Well, that's what we call the eye of the hurricane. Within the eye, there's really not that much wind, and it may be even clear with no clouds. With so even though the hurricane is really bad with a lot of strong winds and storm surge and heavy rainfall, in the eye itself, it's actually pretty calm. The weather can be very nice, almost clear blue skies at times as the eye moves over the area. So it's kind of funny when you think about a hurricane being so bad, but then there's that part of the storm that's really not bad. Aside from the eye, if we move around the eye, we have what's called the eye wall. That's where we get the strongest winds and the heaviest rainfall. Uh, but a lot of these outer bands that extend away from the eye can also cause gusty winds and heavy rainfall as well. So these storms are really big in most cases. And they cover a large area. So you don't necessarily have to have the center or eye to move over your location in your house uh, because the storm could be so big that even the outer reaches of the storm 
might cause problems where you live. That's why these storms are such a big deal because they cover large areas. So I mentioned that Harvey was a category four hurricane at landfall. What does a category four mean? Well, we actually group hurricanes based on how strong the winds are within the storm. And there's these two men, Herb Saffer and Robert Simpson. Uh, one was an engineer and one was a meteorologist. And what they did is they got together to look at how do these hurricanes cause damage based on how strong the winds are. And they came up with this scale, we call it the Saffer Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale, as you can see on your screen, that categorizes the winds of a hurricane one through five. So in other words, if the winds within a hurricane are between 74 and 95 miles per hour, we say that's a category one hurricane. And the scale goes all the way up to category five, where when the winds are 157 miles per hour or stronger, then we call it a category five. So if you think about even the past couple of years, we've had some category five hurricanes. Hurricane Michael hit Florida a couple of years ago as a category five. Uh, Hurricane Dorian last year was a category five uh, when it hit the Bahamas. Even Maria at one point was a category five. It did go down to a category four just before it reached Puerto Rico. But regardless, you can see it doesn't matter if it's a four or a five, the scale says both of those numbers can cause catastrophic damage. So uh, this is what the scale looks like. And I want you to remember this is only talking about the wind in the storm. It doesn't talk about the other hazards, which we're gonna get to later on in this webinar. So if you talk about major hurricanes, major hurricanes are when the storm is either a three, four, or five. What you're looking at on this map is all the places across the Atlantic and the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico where we've had those major hurricanes. And that's shown by the yellow lines. So what do you notice on here? Well, if you look at the western part of the Atlantic on the left side of that image, you'll notice that those yellow lines cover a large portion of that area. In other words, we've had major hurricanes move almost everywhere across the western part of the Atlantic, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. But well, why is that? Well, because the waters there in the ocean are usually pretty warm by the time we get to the peak of hurricane season, and those warm waters are what fuel those storms to get strong. So really, anybody in our part of the world can experience a major hurricane, and that's what we have to be concerned about. If we take that map and we zoom in a little bit closer to where you guys live, uh, first off, looking at Puerto Rico, this is showing you all of the hurricanes that have moved over or near Puerto Rico since 1900. So it's not just major hurricanes, but all hurricanes. And you can see that there have been numerous hurricanes where the center of the storm has actually moved over the island. But there are also storms that have moved nearby the island and still cause a lot of heavy rain or winds and storm surge on the island itself. So since 1900, that's a lot of storms that have affected Puerto Rico. And I think all of you guys living on the island are well aware that you are susceptible to hurricanes almost any year, you have to be ready for them. And this is why, because historically we have seen them move to the island. You can also look at the US Virgin Islands. You can see a same similar pattern that uh, the hurricanes since 1900 have impacted all of the US Virgin Islands and the nearby islands. Uh, one thing I'll note is that on both of these maps, you'll notice that most of the lines seem to kind of go from southeast to northwest. That's the typical track that most storms tend to take in your region of the world. And that's why we're always looking out into the Atlantic at tropical waves and other weather systems that could potentially become hurricanes. Uh, there have been a few storms, however, as you can see on this map, that have actually come from the south and moved over parts of the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So, even though we're always looking to the east, we often have to look at other weather systems that might occur to our south as well, because they can affect us in addition to the ones from the east. Well, now it's time for a pop quiz. So we're, we're going through this webinar with the good information, but we want to actually quiz you guys and see what you think. So I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to go through the answers, and then I'm going to toss it to Dan, who's actually going to open up the poll, and you're going to be able to click on your screen to click the right answer. So here's the question. It's when is the Atlantic hurricane season? Is it A, May through November? B, December through April? C, June through November? Or D, all year long? So I'm gonna pass it over to Dan, who's gonna open up the poll. Thanks, Robbie. I just opened up the poll. Uh, I saw a few votes starting to come in in the question box. So remind folks, try to vote on the poll that pops up on your screen. I see a lot of votes coming in. 
Uh, I will remind folks that might have joined uh, a minute or two late that we are taking questions in the question box. Uh, so we're answering some of those during the webinar and we'll get to many more uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so the votes are coming in. About half the folks have voted. Let's see if we can get a few more votes than that. I see it looks like a lot of people are getting the right answer, which is a good thing. So let me go ahead and close the poll. I'll share those results. And I think I gave it away by saying a lot of folks did get the right answer, but about 80% uh, predicted uh, or said June through November with uh, the majority of the rest of the folks saying May through November. So I'll turn it back over to you, Robbie. Great. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, let's re reveal the answer now. So the answer is C, June through November. So congratulations. It sounds like the majority of everybody got the right answer. Uh, I will say if you said May through November, you're not too far off because oftentimes, even though June is when we think of the hurricane season starting, Sometimes we can get storms that do form in May. Uh, so it's not officially the start of the hurricane season, but we often do still watch storms in May as well. So if you said either A or C, you were really uh, either got the right answer or were really close. So great job on that. So yeah, so here's the answer. Hurricane season runs from June 1st through the end of November, November 30th. That's the official uh, start and end dates of the hurricane season. Some hurricane seasons can be really busy. This is an example, as you see on your screen, of a satellite image that was taken on September 11th, 2018. And what you'll notice is that there's a lot of different storms on that screen. In fact, just by my eye, if I count, I see one, two, three, four, and maybe even a fifth system here off the coast of Africa. So five, storms all at the same time, all having names. They can be tropical storms, they can be hurricanes. That is a busy time of year when we can get a lot of storms all at once. And at the Hurricane Center, we're having to predict where those storms are gonna go and how strong they're gonna get all at the same time. So we're really busy when it gets to the middle of the hurricane season because that's when the conditions are most uh, conducive for storms to form. So if you look at most hurricane seasons, you might ask, okay, when do we see the most hurricanes? And what you're looking at here is what we like to call our campfire diagram because it looks like a flame, almost like a fire. We're out camping. Uh, and what you're seeing on this image is that the top of the flame is around September 10th. So historically, if we look at when all the hurricanes have formed, that's about the date when we would expect to see the most hurricanes. Now, it doesn't mean that every year we're gonna have a hurricane on September 10th. It just means if we add them all up, that's the date that we tend to see the most. You can see that as you start the season in June, there's really not that much activity. You might see a storm here or there, uh, but as we get into August, then especially September, that's when things really get busy. After September 10th, things start to quiet down, but we can still see a lot of uh, activity through October, once we get to November, that's when the activity really starts to quiet down, especially as we get to the latter part of the year in December. So we like to say that August, September, and October are our busiest months on average. That's when we're the busiest, watching storms, forecasting storms, and that's when you need to be most on guard for storms to potentially affect your areas. So let's turn to the hurricane hazards. I think I mentioned earlier that it's not just wind we're concerned about. There are lots of different hazards with storms. So if you think about all those hazards, I'm gonna ask another question. We're not gonna open this one up for you to actually vote on. I just want you to think about this question. And if you think you have an answer, maybe you can scream it out loud to your family and see what they think. But here's the question. What are the primary hurricane hazards that come with hurricanes? Is the answer A, high winds, B, storm surge, C, heavy rainfall from, uh, from the storm, D, dangerous surf, or E, all of the above. So of all those hazards, which one do you think are the primary ones? Well, the answer is actually E, all of the above. So all of those things you see there, the wind, the storm surge, the rainfall, the surf, the waves of the ocean, they're all things that we are concerned about when a hurricane comes to where we live. It's not just about wind. 
So you might be looking at that slide and saying, wow, that's a lot of stuff to remember. How am I going to remember all of those things that can come with a hurricane? Well, the good thing is, is we have a word for you to remember that can uh, help you remember all those hazards. So I want you to remember this word, SWIFT, S-W-I-F-T. And each of those letters in that word stands for a different hurricane hazard. So what do you think the S stands for? Storm surge, right? That's the one that begins, begins with S. So storm surge is the water from the ocean. And Andy's going to talk more about this coming up here, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But I just want you to remember that the S stands for storm surge. The W in SWIFT stands for wind. That's what most people think about, right? The hurricanes come with a lot of wind, and that's what the W stands for. The next two letters are actually combined. I and F stand for inland flooding. So while storm surge is flooding that occurs from the ocean, inland flooding is flooding that occurs from the heavy rains that fall from storms. You get a lot of heavy rain in hurricanes, and when that heavy rain falls, it has to go somewhere, and oftentimes we can get inland flooding from that heavy rainfall. And lastly, the T stands for tornadoes. Uh, most of the time, people think about tornadoes in the middle of the United States. I mean, that's where we get those really big tornadoes. But oftentimes, hurricanes can bring tornadoes as well. So it's just another hazard we have to be concerned about. Now, there's one more hazard that we did off, uh, touch on already that's not included in this word, and that's the waves and rip currents that can occur at the beach from these storms. And so you also have to be concerned about those hazards as well. So again, remember this word, SWIFT, because I think it'll help you to remember all the different hazards that can come with these storms. So lastly, I have one more question I'm gonna ask you guys, and we're gonna open the poll up again if we need to vote. And then when we're done there, I'm gonna pass it over to Andy, who's gonna talk about all of these hazards. So here's the last question. Of the hazards that I just talked about, which hazard has caused the most deaths in the United States? Is it A, wind, B, storm surge, C, flooding, or D, tornadoes? I'm going to pass it back over to Dan for the poll. Thanks, Robbie. I just opened up the poll. I see folks are voting. So I'll give everybody a few minutes. And again, a reminder to ask those questions. As we get to the end of the presentation, we'll answer a lot of those. I've gotten a lot of great questions. Actually, I've written some of them down, so we make sure we won't forget some of those great questions you're sending in. And I'll give it another few seconds for folks to vote. Okay, I think I'll go ahead and close the poll and see if I can share those results. So it looks like um, uh, it was almost a tie uh, between flooding and tornadoes, and the storm surge uh, came in next, and uh, wind was all the way at the bottom with only 4%. So uh, Andy, I think you're up next, and I'll pass it over to you to share the uh, answer. All right, thanks, Dan. So uh, all of these hazards are deadly, uh, but the correct answer in this case is storm surge. Now, I myself, I live a few miles inland from the coast, and we're about uh, 15 feet or so above sea level here. So when I think about hazards from hurricanes, I think about wind. I think about the large trees we have over our house and branches falling and, and uh, damage caused to the roof. A lot of folks, think about when is a main hurricane hazards, but the truth is for a lot of folks that live by the coast or if you're in a flood prone area, water is what really should be thinking about. A lot of people don't think about it. In the top left-hand corner here, you see people being rescued from floodwaters caused by rainfall. In the bottom left, we have what Robbie was talking about, storm surge. The water is actually being pushed inland from the ocean and flooding areas that are normally dry. In this case, this car is actually being swept away by moving water caused by storm surge. Water is what really kills in hurricanes. Although all the hazards are deadly, water accounts for nine out of 10 fatalities during a hurricane. Half of them come from storm surge. 
if you look at this pie chart, over a quarter of them come from rainfall related flooding. So that's freshwater rainfall and runoff related flooding. And some of the other water related fatalities are caused by the rip currents and offshore floodings like uh, if a boat capsizes, for example. But again, you do see that wind and tornadoes do cause fatalities in a hurricane. So we talk about storm surge, we talk about the water moving inland from the coast as a hurricane pushes all that water on shore. This is Manhattan, New York. Uh, normally on a, on a typical day, folks are walking around, there's vehicles driving around. There's a restaurant front here at this corner. I want you to pay close attention to this because when Hurricane Sandy, which was a very large sprawling hurricane, moved inland, it brought a bunch of seawater with it. And you can see the water is a few feet deep up on this restaurant front. It's almost more than halfway up this vehicle over here and about halfway up the van. So these folks were trapped inside this building until the waters receded later on after the hurricane passed. Now, a lot of this water looks like it was mostly standing water, maybe moving slowly. One of the other big threats from storm surge is when the water is moving inland and there's waves on top of that. And so when you have that kind of movement of water, you picture yourself in the water at the beach. You're standing in water a few feet deep and you have a wave a few feet tall hit you. That can easily knock you over. Well, water is very heavy. It's very dense. And so when it moves inland from the coast and has waves along with it, it can take houses very easily off their foundations and it will flood the houses at the same time. And so that's why storm surge is so deadly because if folks do not evacuate when there's a threat of storm surge, they can be stuck inside those homes as the water's moving in. Flooding is another reason why there's uh, a lot of fatalities in tropical cyclones. And it's not just hurricanes that can cause it. This uh, image I'm about to show you was from tropical, tropical Storm Allison, never became a hurricane. In 2001, it struck Houston, Texas. Uh, so we talk about flooding rainfall. We say, okay, rainfall runs off your roof into the ditches and into the lakes. Well, if there's too much rain, those ditches, those lakes get overwhelmed. And so water has to go somewhere else. In this case, the water flooded the interstate corridor, Interstate 10, looking west towards Houston, Texas. This water ended up being several feet deep. This is a semi-tractor trailer. This is several feet deep of water in a normally dry area. And so if you lived or if you're in one of these semis or you lived in an area that was flood, prone to flooding rain, flooding from rainfall, that is also why it's so hazardous. And a lot of folks, when these heavy rainfall events happen, they have to be evacuated from the top of their roofs. And a lot of that happened in Katrina, and it likely happened during this storm. We said tornadoes can also be deadly. Water spouts, the difference between the two, water spouts are simply over water. Tornadoes are over land. Yes, as an image on the right shows you, water spouts can move onto land and become tornadoes. Robbie also mentioned waves and rip currents a couple of times. So the storm could be a few hundred miles off the coast. It could be a sunny day, and the beach could be open, and folks could be out there by the water. It could still be a very dangerous situation because what can happen is these storms produce large waves and what's called swell. These waves move to the coast, they will break along the beach, and then the water has to move back out. You've been in the water before at the beach, you know when the wave goes past you, breaks along the coast, and there's a pull back. Well, if you get stuck in one of these channels that get created along the sandbar, that's when you're getting stuck in a rip current. And now the folks at the weather forecast office can issue a rip current statement to try to highlight that hazard if they see the conditions there or along the beach if they have this uh, kind of hazard in place they might have beach warning flags out that kind of warn you of the potential danger so how do we predict these hazards how do we predict how strong the storm's going to be and where it's going to go well first we start off with all of the data the live data we have observations coming in across land we have ships sending observations to us of temperature, wind speed, pressure. We have uh, drop sons going out of aircraft. We have weather balloons being launched across the country to try to sample the atmosphere and try to determine um, what is going on in the atmosphere if it's going to be steering the storm one way or the other. And we have satellites in outer space. This picture in the bottom left-hand corner is a snapshot from outer space. And they take these pictures very frequently so we can watch the storm evolve. We can watch to see if the storm is growing in size or in intensity and where it's headed. We also have Doppler weather radars. Uh, they have one in Puerto Rico. They have them across the United States. And as the storm is nearby, those can actually get a really good read of what's going on inside the storm. And they can actually track tornadoes inside the storm as well. 
most of this data will get ingested into these very sophisticated computer models that are run on supercomputers. And there's a lot of different computer models. Our job at the Hurricane Center is to look at all the data coming in, determine what the size and strength of the storm is currently, and help with some of the guidance from the computer models to determine how big the storm's going to get and where it's going to head. And I said, yes, we do fly airplanes into hurricanes and they do drop instruments into hurricanes. There's a few different types of aircraft. You have a jet propelled aircraft in the top left hand corner that typically samples the environment around and above the storm. And so it'll try to determine what the steering flow will be. So it'll help determine where the storm is going to go, but also can sample uh, the different levels of the atmosphere to determine if there's wind shear, which will be uh, strong wind shear means it's uh, unfavorable for development of a hurricane. The two aircraft on the right with a propeller powered aircraft, these will go right into the storm. They will fly into the eye of the hurricane. They will sample on the aircraft and drop instruments into the storm to try to sample what's going on in the storm. What's the structure of the storm like? How strong is this storm? When it's over the ocean, this is one of our best tools we have to get the most accurate information for ourselves and try to get the best analysis of what's happening. And so what happens is when these storms actually penetrate into the eye of a hurricane, you're seeing this on the right hand side. The lower clouds is in the eye. Picture a, the circular shape. It's kind of like being in a football stadium. You're, you're in the low level clouds in the center, which is more stable, which is why we call uh, the eye of the storm is typically calm. But you have the very violent thunderstorms or storms on the edge of this uh, eye wall is what we call it, which creates a stadium effect which can cause you to feel like you're in the center of a football field looking at the stands of a stadium. This is a glimpse inside the hurricane center, inside our operations, and then on the left-hand side uh, of folks actually giving media interviews during an approaching uh, hurricane for the United States. And so what they're doing is uh, giving interviews for, through television. You see a lot of cameras over on the right set up in our conference room. We also get phone calls for radio interviews, from newspaper interviews, uh, and we also post social media posts as things are evolving to try to get the information out to you. And we also, on our hurricanes.gov website, will provide uh, continuous updates every time we issue a new forecast. So you might have some questions such as, do I have an evacuation plan in place? Do I need to evacuate? What can I purchase to get ready for the season? Well, this one-stop shop guide, weather.gov slash WRN, slash hurricane engine preparedness will help you prepare for all of these questions you might have. This is going to be available through Hurricane Preparedness Week coming up next month. So now if you haven't already asked questions, feel free to add additional questions and we're going to have Dan and John help field those questions for you here for the next half hour or so. Thank you, Andy. Uh, we did leave uh, plenty of time for questions, and there's a really a lot of really good questions. Uh, happy about seeing all these questions. Now we've answered some, uh, but we're going to get to as many as we can here. So I'll start with the question that I really liked. Uh, this was from Isabella. I think I'll turn it over to Robbie. Uh, maybe somebody else wants to comment as well, but I'll turn it over to Robbie first. It was Ella, Isabella asking, do hurricanes actually help the world? Wow, that's a hard one. <laughs> Do they help the world? So uh, sometimes yes, um, and that might be surprising. So oftentimes, maybe you guys have heard of what's called drought. Now, drought is when you have a very long period of time where you just don't get any rain. And obviously we all need rain, right? We need rain to grow our, our plants. We need all the plants around the world. They need rain to grow. And we need water to drink. We often keep water water in reservoirs and lakes so that we have that water available to us to drink. So there are times where these droughts occur and we need rain. And sometimes it takes a hurricane or a tropical storm to come by and to actually provide the rain that can actually refill those lakes and reservoirs. So even though hurricanes can come with bad conditions with the wind and storm surge, oftentimes the rain that comes with it can be a good thing. That doesn't mean every time it's a good thing, but when we're having a drought, it can be a good thing. Thanks, Robbie. Uh, I got a great question for Ernesto. It's from Lee, who asks, what was the worst hurricane to hit Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands? I think you're muted, uh, Ernesto. <laughs> 
I was too. <laughs> I was in the middle of the, of the answer. And, okay, I had to I'm start. sure it was a good one. <laughs> yeah, let's see if it comes out the same way. Uh, yeah, we, we can go back to 2017. We got two, even three uh, major storms in, in, near our area. But before that, we have San Felipe, it was 1928, that also affected the Virgin Islands. San Santiago, that was the, one of the biggest storms that affected the island, it generated a lot of rain. That was in 1899. That affected St. Thomas, St. John, and Puerto Rico. So we're in the middle of the, the, the hallway of hurricanes. This storm had happened before, and more stronger storms could happen in the future. So we need to be prepared uh, as citizens because it's going to happen again. You know, we had two, two of them in one year. Uh, we could have that again. So my, 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 my opinion is that people should prepare always, even if they, they say that the season is going to be a, a relaxed season. You know, we need always to be prepared. Thanks, Ernesto. I'm going to send another one right back to you. Uh, you know, I know a lot of folks answered our poll question about flooding being one of the leading causes of deaths. And I know it's a big problem in Puerto Rico, and you can talk about that. Uh, but Camilla asked, uh, who sends out the various cautions and warnings for things like tornadoes and flooding? And so I would just say, I know it's you all, but you can maybe describe how you do that. And then again, the importance of why you all send out those uh, flood uh, and tornado alerts. Okay, so the warnings and watches for tropical cyclones are issued by the Hurricane Center, you know, talking to each other and doing, making that, making that decision together. But during the storm, we need to do also uh, other impacts like flooding. So we do flat flooding uh, warnings for, for the area that is getting affected. Something that is very important is that when that eye leaves the, the island and the National Hurricane Center can drop their, their warnings and watches, the different types of advisories, we still need to work on the weather occurring behind the system. So we had uh, many times, many uh, uh, examples of when the storm leaves and everybody thinks everything is over, that the watches are out, the warnings are canceled, we start getting heavy rain across the island. So that's when the National Weather Service office here in the local office in San Juan issue these warnings because that's the danger at the moment. It's not the wind, maybe it's not that much about the, the uh, ocean condition, but it's the rain left behind by the storm. Thanks, Ernesto. I think I'm gonna send this one to Andy. Andy, it says, uh, this was from Angel, and they said, uh, he said, why do hurricanes start near Africa? That's a great question, John. So what we have, we have what is called tropical waves that emerge off Africa. They form over the tropical rainforest there uh, due to a mountain range over uh, Eastern Africa. And they travel across Africa, they emerge over the Atlantic Ocean there. And certain times of year, the water's plenty warm off the coast of Africa. And these tropical waves already have some turning with them in the atmosphere. We call that a pre-existing disturbance. And so when those reach the warm waters and they turn and have plenty of thunderstorms with it, they a lot, a lot of times will turn into storms and spin up into them a uh, short time after they move off Africa. You'll see sometimes they'll take a while longer and that's when you see them sometimes form closer to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. And sometimes there's only a few days warning before the storms hit, but sometimes you'll see them form right off Africa and you'll see them going along for a week before it even gets there. Thanks, Andy. I was actually going to turn the next one over to you. That was also from Angel. I think I'll go ahead and do that here real quick. Uh, uh, it was. Uh, we've had a lot of questions, not just from Angel, but there's been quite a few about how hurricanes move. So I was going to throw you over to that and uh, let you tell folks uh, how they actually uh, move around the Atlantic. Okay, sure. So I, I know you folks where you're living at here is um, you'll see storms a lot of times come right through your area. And sometimes you'll see them turn way out to sea before they ever get there. And you're probably wondering, okay, what causes that to happen? So we have what's called a ridge of high pressure that typically sits from like the eight doors extending across much of the central Atlantic. And picture a hurricane as a kind of a, um, a leaf floating in the stream. And so they kind of just move along with the flow. And so what will happen is you have this big ridge turning 
in the waters across the central Atlantic and the storms will move along typically from east to west if that high pressure is in place. And if it's in place far enough west, it'll keep on going right into the Caribbean Sea. What happens is if, let's say, a cold front might dig south in the central Atlantic that time of year, that creates a weakness in the ridge. And so the ridge kind of splits in two. And so you have the storm kind of turn around before it ever gets there. So this picture, there's highs and lows out there and the hurricanes kind of go in between them as they get floating, as they pretty much float around in the stream. Thanks, Andy. Uh, go, there's been a lot of questions specifically for Puerto Rico and comments, so I'm going to send this one to Ernesto. It says, I mean, you may have already answered this, Ernesto, but I think we could probably go over it one more time. It says, this is from Ian, uh, why is there a lot of hurricanes near Puerto Rico and what could we expect for this season? Well, our official forecast comes out on the end of May. But all the our, uh, academia and other organizations are saying it's going to be mostly active. So that's not important. The important thing is that we need to be prepared. You know, there, there are years like 1992 that uh, they were forecasting a relaxed year. And we only had one storm. But that big storm was Andrew. And then you compare it to 2005, that we had 27 storms, and none of them affected Puerto Rico. So it's, it's good to know what's going to happen uh, on the season, what is the forecast. But as citizens of Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, we need to be always prepared. We are on the corridor of the, of the hurricanes, so they tend to move across the area because this is trying to follow the, like what Andy was saying, follow the, the high pressure, the, uh, uh, the Azores high pressure, the Bermuda high. So we are geographically talking about we're more exposed than other people in the in the Caribbean because of that. Thanks, Ernesto. And I'll just also say thanks, Isabella, for uh, the shout out saying that uh, so far you're thinking this is awesome and that you're uh, having a good time listening. Uh, I'll uh, send a question over here to Robbie at this time. Uh, this is from Carmen, and there's been a couple of others along these lines, too, about the aircraft, about how can these aircraft withstand the strong winds and the storm? But also, uh, uh, Carmen specifically asked what kind of instruments uh, get thrown out of the hurricane plane. Yeah, great question, uh, Carmen. So, yeah, you might be thinking, how how can these planes fly into these hurricanes? These hurricanes are so strong with the wind, and how can the plane withstand that? Well, really, if you think about it, if you take a just a commercial air airline flight from, say, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, uh, maybe to Miami, where we live. Um, that plane often encounters winds that can be even stronger what, than what you would see in a hurricane because there's the jet stream way up high in the atmosphere uh, that usually blows from west to east and those jet stream winds can be really strong. So planes are already flying with or against the jet stream that can withstand those winds. So flying into a hurricane itself, even though the winds are strong, uh, it's really no big deal for them. Now the only problem with the hurricanes is that it can be really bumpy. Uh, so that's the one thing that uh, I know the pilots and meteorologists on board are concerned about is when the plane starts bumping around with the turbulence, uh, that cannot be, it's not really that comfortable from what I hear. And I don't want to do it because I don't like turbulence. Uh, but the other question you had was about the instruments that the plane has. Well, the, the plane itself actually has instruments on it. So we can measure the wind, the temperature, and the atmosphere. But then they also release instruments from the belly of the aircraft. So underneath, there's like a hole where somebody on the plane will release what's called the drop song. Through the hole, it falls out the bottom of the, of the plane and then falls down through the hurricane. And that instrument is also measuring the wind in the hurricane and the temperature and how much moisture is in the air. Um, and all of those different uh, pieces of information that those instruments are kind of collecting, that all then gets sent to us as hurricane forecasters, and also it's brought into the computer models that we use to simulate hurricanes. So the planes are really important for us because it's one of the only ways that we can actually see and understand what's going on in the storm itself. Thank you, Robbie. Um, Andy, I think I'm going to send this one to you. So many good questions, it's kind of hard to pick. Uh, but this one came in earlier on. This is from Andrea. And when we were talking about the categories of hurricanes, she says, how do you know the category? How do you know the speed, wind speed of a hurricane? 
Okay, it, it actually uh, depends on uh, what the scenario is. Let's say the storm's way out over the middle of the Atlantic, and we have only satellite data to tell us how strong it is. We have uh, what we call a satellite estimate. We try to say, okay, based on how the storm looks, we think it's the wind speeds are this strong, and we fit it into the category associated with that wind speed. Let's say we're closer to the coast and we have aircraft flying into it. Well, we might use that aircraft data as our as our main way to determine the wind speed. If the wind speed, let's say they drop that drop sond into the eye wall of the hurricane, and that might be where we think the strongest winds are, we'll use those values and say, okay, let's say the storm has 115, 120 mile per hour winds, that's probably a category three hurricane. Uh, if it's close enough to land that we can actually have either have a radar or have observations on the ground, then that makes it even very accurate information as far as how strong it is because we might have a lot of data points to look at. And we use the, typically the strongest value of those to sustain winds, uh, how long it, winds blow for about a minute or so um, to determine what the wind speed is at that point. Thanks, Andy. Um, still a lot of great questions. Um, I do have a question here for you, uh, Ernesto, talking about uh, tornadoes and uh, if they happen in Puerto Rico and how common uh, do you do you get those? Well, most of the of the the tornado we have are associated to water spouts. Water spouts are similar; they are cousins of the tornadoes. They develop from maybe most of them are fair weather, uh, so it's, you don't have to have big or strong thunderstorms, you can have uh, uh, just a line of, of, of rain, of showers or clouds, and you can get a, a fair weather water spout. But this water spout, when it touch a uh, land, has to uh, be classified a tornado. This happens a lot along the coast, in the eastern coast of Puerto Rico. On the western side of the island, uh, sometimes we get a uh, strong thunderstorm that can really uh, develop strong, strong uh, uh, tornadoes, not like the type that we see in the Midwest, and when you see cow flying, right, like in the movie, uh, but still, the, you can do some significant damage. During um, hurricanes, we uh, get tornadoes, especially on the rain bands. Uh, this this time with Maria, we lost our more significant instrument to to find tornado signatures. That was the radar, so it was very hard for us to uh, verify if, how many tornado we have with Maria. Thank, thanks, Ernest. I'm gonna throw another one to you. Uh, this one's from Bernard. There's been lots of questions about Hurricane Lenny, uh, and they said they heard it was going the wrong way. And did that hit Puerto Rico? What happened with that hurricane? Hurricane Sordo, uh, the lefty. Yeah, this storm, I remember I was doing my master's in, in Illinois. So I, I was not here uh, in Puerto Rico. But it was uh, a system that developed uh, late in the season, so the wind patterns already changed. The system developed in the Yucatan Peninsula. So I remember my mom calling me, oh, we're gonna have a hurricane in the next few days. I'm like, there's nothing out there, mom. But when I, I turned on, this is before the internet, right? When I turned on the, the weather channel, I saw the, that cone of, 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 of forecast cone pointing to us. So, the reason that I was moving to the wrong side it was it was late on the on the season and the wind that steers uh, the storms already changed more westerlies. That was 1999 November. Thanks, uh, Ernesto. Um, there's some really uh, tough questions from Kai. There's a couple that have come in, and uh, uh, there's two that I, it's hard. One. One, I think I'll ask here, uh, you know, because they they must see all the various models. We talk about some of the models we use. So, uh, what are some of the models that we use, Robbie, when we do forecasts, and and how how are they used to make uh, our our track uh, forecasts? Yeah, well, we're getting to the advanced course now. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys have probably all heard about the models we use, and there's all these different names. So. There's a lot that we use. I can't, I don't have time to go over all of them, but there are some, a few that are the main ones. So if we're talking about track, where's the storm gonna go? We have the American model, which is called the GFS, stands for Global Forecast System. There's a European model, ECMWF we call it. 
And then there's also a model from the United Kingdom, UK Met model. Um, those are just three. There's also some others, HMON, HWERF. Um, again, I don't have time to get to all of them. And our job as a hurricane specialist is to look at all those different models and then come up with our forecasts. Some of them are good in some cases. Uh, there are other cases where one might not be so good. And through our experience, we've come to realize the different times when some of those models might be better than others. One thing I'll also note is that when we're looking at all those models, often what we do is we do some sort of averaging of the models. So if I have, let's say, a bunch of numbers, one, two, three, four, five, I take an average of those numbers, I get three, right? Well, we do the same with the models. If we have five different models, they're all showing the hurricane going in different locations, we'll often average those models to come up with what we call a consensus. And then we use that consensus to also help us make the forecast as well. So it takes a lot of experience getting used to how these different models behave, uh, but there are a lot of them that we look at. Thank Thanks, you, Robbie. Sorry, before I pass it over to you, John, I saw someone sure. followed up and said, uh, it basically says, which one's the most advanced? But I, since I, I know you have to do uh, a report every year on the Hurricane Center forecast along with all the models, which one's better, the Hurricane Center forecast or the models? <laughs> The Hurricane Center forecast, I'm proud to say, yeah, we the Hurricane Center forecast beats all of the models when you look at them separately. And part of the reason we do is because we look at the models kind of together and do, as Robbie mentioned, this consensus approach, uh, which usually turns out to be the most accurate. So um, a little plug to use the Hurricane Center forecast and the weather service prediction that you'll get from Ernesto and, and others. Um, I'm going to toss this next question. This is a tough one. Uh, Andy, I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to give it to you since Robbie just answered one. Um, this came up from a couple of different um, of the students. It's talking about Saharan dust from Africa. And it's saying, how does that affect hurricane intensity and even hurricane formation? That's another really advanced question. You guys are really smart. Uh, so African dust, uh, you, actually, you see African dust in the... Um, in the islands and Puerto Rico uh, throughout the summertime. Um, and so a lot of times you'll have a tropical wave pass and then behind you'll have all this dust with it. So basically you try to picture the, um, the air mass associated with that dust. You have a lot of dry Saharan air and there's a lot of dust in there blown off because of the, um, the Saharan desert. And so what typically happens uh, is, a, is that dry air will typically inhibit development or if there's a storm let's say embedded in it, it might have the tendency to pull in some of that dry air, which can cause more fluctuations in intensity and usually towards a downtrend. Um, so I they say the general consensus would be to weaken them. Sometimes though, the storms get enough moisture of their own and enough environment around themselves to kind of protect themselves from that dust. And they'll just continue on their own merry way without being affected by the dust. So a lot of it depends on how much of that dust is being drawn into it and how how strong the storm is kind of in that environment already. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm sending this one over to Ernesto. A very similar question we got on Monday, and I know it's because, uh, you know, the, the, there have been a lot of earthquakes in, uh, in Puerto Rico in this past year. And so they're asking, can an earthquake uh, happen while the hurricane is also happening? And uh, let you answer that one. Okay, first of all, there are two events completely different. You know, we got the hurricanes and then we got a different even science to deal with the, um, the earthquakes. But I remember when I was a kid during Hugo, we had a, like a four point something during Hugo. And a question they always make to me during Maria, uh, after Maria, right? It was during Maria, they felt their houses shaking. So everybody ha had that question that there was an earthquake. Uh, it was a 2.7, but no, the houses were shaking because of the strong winds. The oscillation uh, uh, the, done by the winds made the, the house to feel like it was shaking. Hey, Ernesto, this is another one for you. It's not really a question. It's more of a comment. There's been lots of lots of comments about Maria and how it's changed people's lives there in Puerto Rico. Um, lots of descriptions. I don't know if you want to kind of give a perspective for everybody listening. How how strong was Maria? How bad was Maria for the island of Puerto Rico sort of in history when it comes to hurricanes? Well, John, I, I remember going for Irma to do the, the document the damage. 
And when I saw uh, the damage done by, by Irma and St. Thomas, I'm like, we're not ready for this, right? Two weeks after that, we had Maria. And Maria, even it was a Cat 4, the damage we saw across the island was incredible. So I thought that we already, you know, had the big one that year with Irma. But when I saw Maria, it completely changed my, 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 my view of, of what is a strong storm. The destruction we saw was catastrophic, you know, and, and I saw it in both islands and it was incredible. And then next, the year after that, I saw Michael, the damage of Michael. So in two years, I saw the damage of three uh, catastrophic uh, hurricanes and Maria is up there. It's up there because all the damage, not only uh, to the infrastructure, it's also the damage they, they, they did to, to the people. You know, two, we already more than two years from, from Maria, and you can see all the questions, all the comments from Maria. And I think uh, it, it impacts us as a pe person, as a, like the psychological side of Puerto Rico. So every time you guys come out with that forecast, put it close, uh, storm close to us, I think Puerto Rico really go back to the Maria days and remember, have the, the flashbacks of Maria. Thanks, Ernesto. Uh, I did get a follow-up question for uh, Robbie about what we talked about with the instruments in the aircraft. Uh, this one was asking, uh, uh, do we get any of those instruments back? Uh, so I'll let you let you answer that one. Yeah, so the drop zones, uh, we don't get them back. Uh, they fall into the ocean and most of the components of those drop zones are biodegradable. Uh, so they just break down in the water and, and so forth. So uh, the drops on themselves, no, we do not get them back. Um, other instruments on the plane, they're attached to the plane. So yes, we, we do keep them. Um, I would actually like to toss some of this question to Ernesto because uh, we haven't talked about balloons at all. But just like we drop instruments from a plane, uh, your office actually launches balloons from the ground up. And I know sometimes you can recover some of those instruments. And I thought maybe you could talk on that. You matter of fact, yesterday, uh, 911 had received a call. They, they, they got a, a balloon in, in the town of Comerio. So they had to send people over there to pick up the balloon. Some of the balloon crashed in, into land, but because we're a small island surrounded by a lot of ocean, right? Most of the instruments disappear or get lost in the ocean. Thanks, Robbie and Ernesto. Uh, Andy, I'm going to toss this one to you. It's a little outside of our expertise, but I wondered if you can kind of give some comments because it's come up more than once. But the specific question came from Luis. He says, we know hurricanes happen on Earth, but is there any evidence that it happens on other planets? Anything you okay, want to say about well, that? Okay, so I, I've, I've seen some documentaries before. So uh, you've seen Jupiter before, right? A picture of Jupiter? You see there's a big swirl or big dot on Jupiter. That may or may not be similar to what a hurricane would be like <clears throat> on Earth. You see the flow around that is is turning and they, they show a time lapse of that turning over time. Now it might not be rainfall, it might not be clouds of water moisture like we would say, it might be other clouds of different chemicals, but I believe the same mechanisms are happening there. The physics work similar on other planets just like they work on earth and so when you have planets turning and rotating and and air moving from one place to another these systems can develop that big red spot doesn't go away though so it'd be like having a hurricane <laughs> over your house forever <laughs> the uh let's see i uh, we know we're running out of time so we are going to have to sign off here shortly uh there was one question from uh uh, Camille uh, asking about what would happen if there are two hurricanes really close together. So maybe I'll throw that one over to Robbie since Andy, you just an answered the last one. Sure, yeah. So, you know, whether it's over the Atlantic or the Pacific, which is also an area that we watch, uh, it seems like almost every year we have two tropical systems that start to get kind of close to one another. And so it's always a question for us, of, okay, what's going to happen? Well, uh, the two, they don't necessarily merge. What usually happens is because they both have wind patterns around them, they start to almost rotate around each other. Now, what can happen is if one of the storms ends up being bigger than the other one, then what can happen is that the wind patterns can almost make the smaller one kind of get sucked into the bigger one 
and it just dissipates, goes away. Uh, so they don't necessarily come together and cause a super big, strong hurricane. Usually what happens is one of them is bigger uh, already and it just kind of eats up or sucks in the smaller one and it just becomes one uh, normal system. Do we have time for one more question you think, Dan? I think so, and then uh, go ahead, Ed John. I might follow up okay. one quick one too, but go ahead. All right, we got time for just a couple more. All right, so I guess I'll go, go to Andy on this one. So Andy, a uh, question came in from a couple of different students, says, how can we tell if hurricanes are gonna get really strong? How do we know how they evolve with their strength or intensity? Okay, so there's a few different ingredients uh, we look at when we're trying to determine what the environment is for a hurricane or storm to become very intense. Uh, the first thing we can look at is water temperatures. They have to be a certain temperature to a certain depth to get that energy to fuel themselves. Uh, the second is the system needs to be in a um, moist environment. We talked about African dust. Uh, so if there's a lot of African dust around, it might be not conducive for development, it might be unfavorable. But if there's a lot of moisture in place, a lot of warm water below, those are two pluses. The other one is we call wind shear. If there's a lot of strong winds in the atmosphere, those picture of a thunderstorm growing vertically, if there's a lot of winds in the atmosphere, it kind of blows the top off that storm in a way. And so that actually is unfavorable. Strong winds in the atmosphere are unfavorable for the uh, intensification of a hurricane. So if you have those three ingredients coming together, those are can typically make the strongest storms. Thanks, Andy. So there have been uh, several questions uh, related to the strongest, deadliest uh, uh, hurricanes, uh, some of the biggest two. Um, I don't know, maybe we can all kind of answer a little bit of that. Uh, you know, with uh, the deadliest, uh, some of the most deadliest in U.S. history are Katrina, Harvey, and Maria. And then uh, with the, 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 uh, the costliest, the deadliest, then would be storms like the 1900 uh, Galveston hurricane, uh, Hurricane Katrina, of course, and then Hurricane Maria as well in Puerto Rico. Uh, anybody else have any others to add to the list or want to add any, uh, add any of the, some of the strongest and deadliest storms? Is Hurricane Wilma, I think technically was the strongest in Atlantic record, right? The low because of the lowest mm -hmm. pressure. So it's a, it's really between deadliest or most expensive or strongest are a few different categories. And it, one, the strongest storm might not have been the deadliest. It might have been the most expensive. It just depends on where it hits to determine how expensive it is too. Thanks for adding that, Andy. Anybody else? If not, I did have one. Go ahead, Robbie. No. I was going to add that you know some of our storms are becoming more costly. They're costing more when they happen because, uh, as humans, we like to live near the ocean and we build houses near the ocean, and so that's we're putting more stuff in the hurricane's way. So unfortunately, a lot of the storms we've had recently are just becoming more expensive. Thanks, Robbie. There was one question earlier, and I wish I could find who asked it, but I. Can't, oh, here, uh, no, I can't quite find it. Oh, here it is, here. So it was someone, uh, someone named Kimberly, and I kind of maybe end with this, and it's, you know, it, it, the question asked, should we be scared of hurricanes? And I would turn that around a little bit and maybe say, what can we do to be better prepared for hurricanes so that we won't be so scared? So maybe each one can give a preparedness tip of something they might think of doing before as we, uh, as we start to sign off. So I'll start with you, John, and we'll work around. Sure, no problem. It's a great question, Kimberly. I'd say first thing you can do is know if you live in a, in a place that you need to evacuate from. You can actually find that out ahead of time. And if you do live in an evacuation zone, you can kind of talk to your parents and other family members and see where you would go if you had to evacuate. Ernesto? Well, I, I, I will think that Kimberly is, is from Puerto Rico or the Virgin Islands. Um, everything that, that went well during these two storms, do it again. Everything that went wrong, don't use, don't do it. We need to use these two events that occurred two years ago to learn and make better decisions for the future. Robbie? Yeah, you know, one thing we always tell people is have supplies ready before a storm comes. So 
don't wait till the storm is coming at your house, but in the months before, especially when hurricane season first starts, start gathering some supplies, whether it be food supplies or things to make your home stronger. Uh, because that's one thing that makes us scared with these hurricanes is that if we, we think a hurricane's gonna come, what if I don't have food? What if I don't have supplies? Well, get them now, and then that's one less thing you have to worry about if a storm comes. And Andy? So uh, when a hurricane's approaching the area, uh, de depending on what the building codes are in the area, um, you can help prepare your home to make it, if you're not in an evacuation zone, to make it safer when a hurricane approaches. Um, if you have shutters, you can put those up in advance before the storm arrives. Uh, you can ensure there are objects out of the way that could fly around during a storm to keep yourself safe while you're in your house. So you can have that peace of mind. Thanks. And I'll, I'll just add to all that uh, great advice to, you know, talk to your parents. Make sure you're, uh, you're as a family, uh, get involved in hurricane preparedness. Uh, think about, again, think about what you would do. Uh, make those plans so that when the hurricane pops up and Ernesto in his office starts talking about it, that you are already thinking about it and have some of those supplies, as Robbie mentioned, and that we're ready to go uh, this hurricane season. So that's really important uh, advice for you this year. Uh, so that really wraps us up. I know we actually went over uh, a few minutes and a lot of folks still stayed on. So again, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, we are going to be offering a uh, a version of this in Spanish later on in May. We haven't released the details of that yet, but that is in the plans for mid-May. So we'll make sure that uh, uh, the folks at the, the office in San Juan can help us uh, uh, put that information out as we get closer to that. Uh, this weekend was going to be our Caribbean Hurricane Awareness Tour stop in Puerto Rico. Um, it's unfortunate we weren't able to do that. And it's a very popular event, but hopefully some of us will be there next year in 2021 to do that. And uh, Ernesto's office does such a great job at getting that organized. And lastly, I think I want to make sure, and maybe Robbie wants to tell us where you can find the recordings of all these webinars. Uh, once we finish them, we'll have them all posted. So Robbie, I'll let you uh, tell them that. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So by the end of the week, we're going to have these recordings for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands uh, posted on our YouTube channel. That is www.youtube.com slash NWSNHC. Or just go to YouTube and search for National Hurricane Center. So you can rewatch this webinar, watch the one that we had on Monday, or even watch the ones from the other states that we're doing uh, for around the different parts of the country. So thanks again, everyone. Um, uh, really appreciate everybody uh, being very attentive and asking us such great questions this morning. Uh, we'll be signing off now and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all very much. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the great questions. Stay safe, everybody. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Thank you.